Welcome to this book launch of The Rebirth of Education, Schooling Ain't Learning. Uh, I wanted to start by putting in context a little bit where CGD has been on education. I'm Nancy Birdsall, the president of the Center for Global Development, and it's fun to see here some of the leaders on education thinking and education policy and development, as well as the crowd among those amongst you who know that Lant is a great economist who's going to bring some, something very fresh and exciting to the field. But what have we been doing on education? I, I asked myself when it came time to work on the preface to the book. Uh, we worked on the Millennium Development Goal many years ago as part of the Millennium Project led by Jeff Sachs. Um, we've done a lot of work, as some of you know, on something we call cash on delivery, which is a way to deliver aid, in which education was the example that Bill Savadoff and I used and had lots of good advice and input from some of the people in the room about how to do that. Charles Kenny, who's here, uh, directed a recent report that leans heavily on some of the work you'll hear about that Lant did and that's in his book. That report was called, or is called, Schooling is Not Education. Uh, and it pushes for much more universal and frequent assessment or measurement of what students are learning in all developing countries. Um, and more international support and encouragement of that approach. And we've worked a lot, as some of you know, on the issue of evaluation. And Lance's book very much reflects some of the incredible work that's been done by dozens of economists and others over the last 10 years, uh, particularly uh, in schooling. Still, in thinking about education, I have to say that we have not had the kind of concerted approach that's reflected in our global health policy program. And the reason for that goes back to this interesting issue for a place like the center that education is very much a policy issue at the national level. Um, it, whether it's working or not is about whether a country's politics and policies that affect schooling and education are working or not. And we at the center have tried to concentrate on what the outside world should do better. But Lance's book has changed my mind. That's kind of the point. Um, it's a stunning book. It stuns me and it worries me on two counts. First, it's so thoroughly convincing in the completeness of the evidence that Lant brings that there's really a big problem of learning despite a lot of schooling in developing countries. And that's true not just in rural India and rural Africa. It's true maybe not as bad, but in urban Costa Rica and in Peru and so on, in middle income countries. And second, Land is not talking about what to do at, at the technical level. He's talking about the problem of education systems in the deeper political and institutional sense, um, that education systems in developing countries are rooted. I think this is what, I don't want to take away from what Land says, but you know, what I get from it is that the systems in developing countries are rooted in the 20th century industrial economy of the rich countries and that that's not working because we're not in the 20th century and the new global economy is not going to be the old factory-based industrial economy for many of the children who are now in school. It's going to be much more interconnected and much more reliant on communications and information and all those modern things, fast moving. And we have a lot more pressure and a lot more reality of international migration um, in this global economy, which is about, is what Lant wrote about in his first CGD book called 
let their people come. So it's all connected. I think Lance's book has made me think and we'll be thinking more about the reality that education is, it's not exactly a global public good, but at the international level, it's a global challenge and that the donors may have been complicit in, in an enlightened but maybe misguided way in pushing systems in the developing world that aren't working. So let me say a little bit about land. Um, yeah, I think maybe the bottom line is, for me, is this prefaces what I hope Lant will say. Is donor money locking in the spider instead of the starfish? If you haven't read the book yet, you'll get it when Lant talks. So Lant, as many of you know, is a professor of, uh, at the Kennedy, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He's a senior fellow here at the Center for Global Development. And more interesting in a way is Lance spent many years at the World Bank. Many of you know that too. He was one of the first research economists who, sh who went to the field, uh, Indonesia and India at least, maybe other places, I'm not sure, and showed how you can do research based in those countries that is matters at the global level and matters for policies in those countries. So in that sense, I, I still think of him very much as a, a leader in shaping uh, the way research is done at the bank, um, at a place like the World Bank. And he has to be one of the most cited development economists in the world on growth, on poverty, on migration, on population and fertility, on education, of course, on the problems of social service delivery. Um, and I think of Lant also, I don't know if Lant will, how Lant will feel about this, but I think he is one of the most important gifts that Larry Summers brought <laughs> to the World Bank and to the development economics profession because it was Larry who brought one of his best students, obviously, uh, to the bank when Larry Summers became the chief economist. And I think we're all seeing some of the benefits of that now. So with that, I turn it over to Lant for, to tell us about the spiders and the starfish, I hope. So um, I want to start with a story. Uh, in 2006, I was uh, living in India, and I went out into the state of Uttar Pradesh, which is uh, one of the larger states of India, has about 100 and, well, I think now almost 200 million people in it. And this NGO was undertaking this endeavor that they simultaneously had a rigorous impact evaluation of, in which they would go into the village, they would test the students during the course of a week, kind of in their house, on a very simple evaluation of their literacy and numeracy. Then at the end of the week, having been kind of hanging around the village, they would hold a village meeting that had the villagers themselves, the parents, the heads of the school and the locally elected officials, and announce the results and talk about them in the hopes that this would mobilize energy and support to like do things better. So. There are three aspects of the story. One, uh, it was really just even for uh, a jaded development practitioner of my age who had seen a lot of things, it really was heartrending to see 11-year-old, 12-year-old kids tell me happily they were in the third and fourth grade and not be able to make out the letters of their own alphabet. They couldn't sometimes orient even which way the words were, you know, the letters were running, much less read words. Um, and you just thought, how can it be that you've like sat in a building called a school for three years and can't do this? Then second, I went, so after having observed this testing in several villages, we went to one of the village meetings. And in the village meeting, a guy who was clearly about my age and had had 
a much harder life than mine, let's be honest, um, had worked in the fields his whole life, and he stood up, and he said to the people on the dais, <laughs> is that what it's called, dais? Dais? Anyway. On the stand, you know, the local leaders and the principal, he said, you have betrayed us. I have worked like a donkey my whole life because the only thing I had was my brute, the strength of my back. But you said, if I sent my child to school, their life would be different. You promised that education would change their life. And now my child's 12 years old, he's in fifth grade, and I learned for the first time that he hasn't actually learned anything, that his life's going to be the same as my life, that he's going to be a donkey and probably just have to work in the fields just like I did. I have to say, this was, this was just truly tragic um, to hear this. Needless to say, 100 people in the audience, about, it was a group about this size, frankly. Hubbub, you know, I don't know. Uh, then after a little while, they, they invited the headmaster of the local school, whose compound we were holding the meeting in, to say what he wanted to say. And he got up and he said, you know, Donkeys come from donkeys. You send your kids to school stupid, they're going to come out stupid. Not my problem, not my fault. It's your own fault. <laughs> Which just was unbelievable that, that they would say it, that you would dare to say that. Um, and moreover, that that would be your response to the fact that the children that were in your charge as a headmaster we're not making learning progress, which illustrated to some extent the fact that there was a complete insouciance of power about the dysfunctionality of the schools, and the principal knew that in no way, shape, or form could this assemblage of villagers affect his career, his job, his pay, his anything, and that he lacked any internal kind of norm of delivering a performance, and yet this was the schooling system they were facing. So, Unfortunately, <clears throat> that experience led me to write a book. <laughs> I thought I had sworn off book writing after having uh, written a, a number of books, but I thought uh, it, it really there is a problem out there in the world that needs to be named and addressed and really tackled head on. So schooling is probably far and away the most successful social movement of the previous century. If you look around in the developed world and say, what did development actually accomplish? No question at all, it got kids in school. The average schooling of adults in the developing world went from only two years in 1950. The accumulated achievement of humankind up to 1950 was an only an average of two years of schooling to 7.2 in a mere 60 years. This is fantastic. This is a fantastic success in commitment, in logistics. It's a social movement that has led Bangladesh today to have a year and a half more schooling of its adults than France had in 1960, even though in France in 1960 it was a fully developed uh, economy with a GDP per capita of 10,000. Bangladesh, with only a GDP now of about 1,500, still has way more schooling. Um, so this has been a spectacularly successful movement in driving towards the universalization of the opportunity and reality of kids being in school. Now, movements to be successful acquire momentum. <laughs> and one of the main messages of my book is the momentum of this movement shouldn't be lost, but it needs to pivot. It needs to pivot from headed exclusively in the direction of measuring schooling exclusively in terms of enrollments and inputs, in terms of measuring school in terms of the skills, capabilities that children acquire while in schooling. So we have had the problem, and by the way, all the artwork is my new daughter-in-law, um, who has dramatically improved my presentations to your benefit. Um, the problem is, is we thought schooling was the ramp to opportunity, that we were going to have kids go into school and through that learning opportunity, they were going to rise, arrive at adulthood equipped with the skills and capabilities they needed to participate in their societies as citizens, to participate as parents, to participate in labor markets successfully, and instead they just are not emerging for schooling equipped for the 19th century, much less for the 
21st because the profile, if we think of the learning trajectory, how much do you, how much education do you get in any metric per year of schooling, all of the premise of universalizing schooling was the, on the premise that that would universalize education, which was on the assumption that you had a learning trajectory that with sufficient schooling would deliver sufficient education. And what we are now in the situation is that in many, many, many countries in the world, the learning profile is just too damn flat. Kids just don't learn much from year to year, which means they leave school dramatically under-equipped for the life they will face. So I'm going to have a little participation. I've, I've been told active learning is good, so I'm going to have a little active learning. <laughs> Not as professors we really believe it, but we're told that. <laughs> so what percent of fourth graders in Andhra Pradesh, which is a middle tier state of India, which you all have some vague ideas of India. So how much of this figure is shaded? So we ask, or uh, researcher Kartik and others ask kids, how much of that figure is shaded? Not even arithmetic, right? It's not even adding anything up. It's just recognizing that we could divide that and we could call one of those a quarter. So how many, what percent of kids got this right? Guesses. Fourth grade, you've been in school four years. It's not like you're a first grader. What? 60. 15. OK. She's read the book already. <laughs> you might think that this is a skill that 60, 70, maybe 45 would be shocking. 30%. Less than a third of kids in fourth grade could look at that figure and say, well, a quarter of that figure is shaded. right?" And and the book, unfortunately, has pages and pages of what I'm about to say. But wait, it's worse than that. It's worse than that in the sense that mostly what kids get correct is repeating in rote fashion what they've learned in rote fashion without actually having any conceptual understanding. So if you ask kids you know, to write down the answer to this question with no prompts, um, uh, these are fourth graders in, uh, in India nationwide now, about half of them can get that right. And that's an algorithmic, you know, that's understanding kind of the manipulation of an algorithm. But if you ask them this question, 24 times 18 is more than 18 times, tw this got mistyped. 24 times 19 is more than 8, 24 times 19 is more than 18, 18 times 24 by how much more? Right? Well, if you understand multiplication, you understand it's repeated addition, which means if I've got 19 24s, I'm 24 more than 18 24s. And this question actually had multiple choice prompts, of which one answer was 24. And less kids got it right than random guessing. So basically, even of the test demonstrated capabilities that students have, where it appears that they understand concepts like multiplication, and, how, and what a perimeter is, when you ask them that same question in a way that requires them to elicit any rudimentary conceptual understanding, like that multiplication is repeated addition, or that if I have a perimeter, I can figure out a problem like this, again, even with four prompts, where you would expect with random guessing to get 25%, you get less than random guessing. Again, Test after test, country after country, we find these same two things, which is that very little understanding, even of basics, very little progress. Well, we'll get to that in a second. And what that means is, if we compare the distribution on PISA, which is mean 500 for an OECD country with a student standard deviation by of, across OED students by construction of 100, we get completely different distributions of skills between developing countries like Indonesia and a typical developed country like Denmark. Whereas if we take level one reading, which just requires simple decoding skills, no critical evaluation, no like understanding of argumentation, we still have almost 60% of Indonesian 15-year-olds are below even that level one of reading ability. And which also means, since the variance isn't any higher in Indonesia than it is in Denmark, Above level four, 
and believe me, if any of your children were below level four, you would be panicked. Because level four kind of is the beginnings of functional literacy where you can read and understand things in a useful way, where a substantial fraction of the Danish kids are up here. Almost no Indonesian child has anything like global skill sets. Anything like global skill sets. And if we move up further, this goes to level five and level six, essentially if you ask how many Indonesian kids are emerging, say, in the global 10%, which would be a skill set that you would want to have at least few people in your country. Essentially, there's just almost no one in the, in the global top 10% in developing countries. Now, if you don't learn much per year, you can do it for a lot of years and still not learn much. So the first response to a learning crisis is, let's do more. Well, if, if they didn't learn what they needed to learn in primary school, let's expand the compulsory schooling to junior secondary. And if they're not emerging from junior secondary adequately equipped, let's expand to secondary schooling. But the problem is if you're walking up a flat ramp, you can walk a long ways and not be very high. So if you just look at questions where we have the same questions have been asked at students at various grades or the same question has been asked over time, what you see is you see a very flat learning profile. The fraction of fourth graders that can do it is not that much higher than the fraction of third graders and so on, which means if you just say, you know, if we take an array of questions and say only about 5% of kids, the improvement in the percent correct averaged across a bunch of language questions which are typically thought of as fourth grade questions was only five percentage points a year. So if you say how many years would they have to stay in before we get to anything like universal ability over the grade school curriculum, they'd actually have to stay in through college. <laughs> If there just aren't enough years in your life if you don't learn very fast. So um, <clears throat> what that means is that if we think about the developing countries pushing their children above a target goal of capabilities, it's going to have to involve some amount of pushing additional enrollment, but a lot of steepening the profile. So these graphs illustrate this. Each of these onions represent the fraction of a cohort in Indonesia that quit or was in this grade or higher when they were interviewed. So this many had ninth grade or higher. So most of them already were in ninth grade or higher, but some dropped out in sixth grade. 1.3% of the children only finished third grade, and so on. So, and then we measured how many of those kids were above some minimal learning goal of 420 on this graph in which 500 is an average OECD. So 420 is a low goal. It's not even aspiring to OECD standards. Just to get to where a standard deviation below where an OECD kid is. Well, it turns out about 42% of the kids are already there because that's the kids that are above this threshold. And this is the distribution of their achievement. This is a complicated graph, but you'll love it in a second. <laughs> it's like modern art. You go, oh. Later, you say, oh, that was, that was enlightening. So, <laughs> so the reason we go to all this trouble is then we use it. Because then we can do some simple simulation. Let's say all of these kids got to grade 9. How many more kids would be above the international threshold? Well, it's easy. We have now just pushed nobody drops out ever. They all stay into grade 9, but we still have the same distribution of performance in grade 9. So now we have 55% of kids who are above the low threshold. Did things get better? Yeah, they got a little better. But really, only about 13 percentage point gain. So of the gap between 42% and wanting 100% or 80%, wanting nearly everyone above that threshold, we're not very much further towards the goal. Right? Now we can think of what's the different simulation. Let's say we leave, we still got the same amount of dropout, but we've steepened the profile. Right? And we've steepened the profile by a student standard deviation. So we've steepened the profile by a lot. right? But we've steepened the profile, and now we still get some kids dropping out in grade 6 and grade 8. We've left all that the same. Now how many kids are above the low threshold? Well, now we've got 68% of the kids above the low threshold. So we've got a 26 percentage point gain from steepening the profile. Because, why? Because lots of kids were here, and they weren't learning anything anyway. So by having these kids learn a lot, you do more. And obviously, if we want to get to anything like universal accomplishment of minimal targets, we need to do both. So if we both steepen the profile 
and push to universal grade nine enrollment, then we get a 42 percentage point gain and we're to the point where about 84% of the kids would be above this low international threshold. So just an elaborate kind of graphical way of thinking we can push more kids through more years, we can push so that more kids learn more per year or we can do both and just unambiguously country after country I I set up these graphs so we can do them again and again and again to illustrate the different positions our country's in. But, you know, country after country after country, if you start, it just kind of the mechanics of it is if you start from shallow and shallow learning profiles, you just can't get there by pushing everybody into school. A, because most everybody is in school, and B, because even when you push, you're up the threshold. So that's the first thing. And again, Remember that big cargo ship in the picture of the momentum? The momentum of the movement is to just push for more. The momentum of the movement is once we have universal primary, let's universalize this, let's universalize this. And the momentum isn't yet towards steepening the profile. The second momentum of the movement is to just put more inputs in, is to say, if the ramp's too shallow, Let's start cranking the ramp up by pushing in inputs. Well, we need more trained teachers. We need smaller class sizes. We need better textbooks. We need better infrastructure. We need girls' toilets. We need lots of things, <clears throat> all of which I have no problem with, except it's not going to add up. It's just not going to add up to anything like the magnitude of gains that are needed. So if you take. <laughs> And there's kind of two reasons for this. One, so there's now literally thousands of studies that examine the relationship between inputs and student outcomes, right? And I'm attempting to summarize what those thousands of things say and kind of we could go over this all day and all night and another day. But basically what it comes down to are these two things. First. Many of the things that look like they're super productive and improve student learning have once-off gains. So when you do a study, you find kids who are in you know, schools with no roof don't learn less than kids that have a school with a roof. OK, that's great. Gives us idea of what to do next. Let's fix the roofs. The problem is there's limited scope to that. Because once all the buildings have a roof, all the, it's kind of that's it. It's not like there's any sense that a thicker roof is going to be more learning than just a rainproof roof or that two roofs is going to be better than one roof. It's kind of a limited scope. So when you look at the input studies, most of the things that turn out to be reliably connected with learning often have very limited scope. The second is that a lot of, a lot of inputs have what a <laughs> variable efficacy. More of them is good if they're good inputs and more of them isn't good if they're not good. And just pumping more water into a leaky bucket gives you a muddy puddle around the bucket, doesn't give you a full bucket. So there are studies in the world showing absolutely rigorously that reduced class sizes will produce higher learning performance. There are rigorous studies in the world that show absolutely rigorously that lower class sizes won't improve performance. Why? Well, we kind of have a common sense answer, which is if you've got good teachers, having more good teacher-student interactions is good. And if you've got teachers that really aren't committed to teaching, really aren't paying attention to what's being taught and aren't doing a good job, having two of those such teachers won't produce additional good. So the combination of these things means that even if I grant you your input fantasy, right? <laughs> We're in an educationist crowd. That might be the fantasy of some. Um, I'll grant you your input fantasy that every school has a roof, and there's a textbook for every child, and every kid has a desk, and class sizes are whatever number you want to name that you think is the appropriate class size. You will roughly get a tenth of the way or less of where you want to be. So most the middle income developed in Latin American countries are about a student standard deviation below the, below the OECD. The poorer countries like India are almost two student standard deviations below. Your input fantasy is going to give you about a tenth of a standard deviation. And you know, do it yourself if you want. You know, take the inputs, add them up, say how far can I go and how far can I push. But having done this off and on for years and years and years, there's just almost no scenario in which an input fantasy 
is going to get you very far along a target. Not that it won't be cost effective. There are certainly cost effective things to do. Um, but it's just not the answer to the problem of, of why and how to get students from a student standard, how to get systems from two student standard deviations where there's almost no learning at all uh, to high performance. And as we see, lots of countries in the world, we've, we've done analysis of what little tracking data we can when we can track performance over time. We get lots of situations like the current story in India where they've had a massive expansion of inputs financed by a massive um, government intervention that's provided financing to states mainly for inputs. And the problem is, is that simultaneously an NGO has been testing about 500,000 or more students a year in rural India and finds pretty consistently uh, that learning's going down. So nobody's suggesting cause and effect inputs cause learning to go down, but it's certainly consistent with the fact that the inputs aren't yet really the key component of the problem. So now, what about us in this room? Well, meaning people who are interested in international education. Um, <clears throat> to some extent, my argument gets worse, <laughs> that the attention to enrollments and inputs can be part of the problem. How can it be part of the problem? Well, there's these two snakes, right? One of these snakes is poisonous. And if it bit you, you would die. One of these snakes is completely harmless. But the beauty of it is, is the harmless snake gets nearly all the survival value of being poisonous without all the bother. All the fangy things and the glands to produce poison. Eh. I'll just look like another snake that's poisonous, and everybody will leave me alone. So there's a phenomena in nature called isomorphic mimicry, or and has lots of different names, in which <clears throat> the scarlet king snake gets by just by being colored by the eastern coral snake. And only the eastern coral snake has to pull the <laughs> freight of actually having high performance. Now, what has it got to do with education? Well. You can easily create the facade of a school and the facade of a school system such that you can attract and keep support both internally and externally for your efforts by going through the motions of building classrooms, hiring teachers, hiring teachers even according to some apparently attractive looking formula for teachers. All the while, you're really just creating an isomorphic mimic of a school. There's no drive for learning inside your school. There's no drive for education inside your system, right? So if you look at what the world system measures, if you go on the World Bank's ed stats, they claim they have 2,500 different indicators of education. <laughs> Almost none of them have anything to do with learning. Anything you want to know about who's sitting in a school the data can tell you how many kids, how many ages, what genders, what locations. Anything you want to know more or less about inputs and expenditures, you can find out. How many teachers per classroom. But then if you say, what are these kids actually being equipped with in terms of skill sets? You have only recently added some data from international organizations, but only less than a quarter of the countries have more than one observation of any internationally comparable test. So for less than a quarter of the developing countries, can we say at all, are you making progress towards any comparable learning target? Right? That said, <laughs> you know, it's unacceptable. It is completely unacceptable to call yourself a country and not report to the UNESCO how many kids you have in school. Right? <laughs> So of the, you know, out of 218 countries, 213 of them have two or more observations on enrollment. So we can track enrollment. And the ones that don't, you know, the ones you might guess don't. Somalia doesn't have that data, for instance. Right? If you're, but pretty much every self-respecting country does. But you don't have to provide the international system any data on learning of any kind to get all the benefits of being a fully respectable, pursuing the education goals country. So now, 
The first of these <clears throat> is changing very fast and changing as we speak in lots of positive ways and due in no small part to some people in this room. But as part of the discussion around the Millennium Development Goals, there are lots of different agencies and organizations <clears throat> who are already trying to shift the agenda of this giant successful crew, uh, uh, ocean liner, pivot the momentum towards learning. So the World Bank's learning strategy, learning for all, that I think was launched in 2012, might have been launched earlier. What? 2010, even earlier than that. Um, the UK's department, DFID, has a new position paper emphasizing learning. Uh, Brookings uh, Center for Universal Education and UNESCO are collaborating, and just last Wednesday in New York launched a new report about learning metrics, which is attempting, again, to lay down what would it be that we would measure in order to have reasonable goals, not just for schooling, but for education. So I think the environment for measuring education and monitoring progress is getting internationally, and the shift in attention, it's happening. It's happening you know, kind of as we speak. Uh, uh, and just in the last few years, I think the attention to this has, has swelling. But the, the difficulty is going to be what is going to be done, because you can't beat something with nothing. So when people come with input-oriented plans for improving learning, you can't just say that's not going to work. That doesn't satisfy the criteria of what would enable a pivot in momentum. You have to say what else would work. Here is where the book pushes uh, <coughs> the frontier hard. <coughs> Meaning, well, you'll see. Um, so my argument is that the answers are out there in the sense that when you look at the micro studies, you see lots of ways in which small kind of changes can actually produce enormous impacts. And remember, your input fantasy gave you a gain if you did everything in it of about 0.1 effect sizes, right? We see, you know, just shifting to private schools in Pakistan that have less inputs than the public schools actually have effect sizes of 0.3. We see enormous effects of remediation programs in India. Some programs in urban India have a 0.6 effect size, which again, is just enormous by these kinds of things. And we're, they're producing summer camps that focus on specific learning skills that produce a year's worth of learning progress of the average schools in a summer camp of less than six weeks. So enormously more effective and cost effective. We see contract teachers being hired in lots of places, but rigorously evaluated in Kenya, among other places, where the contract teachers are producing large learning gains, even in the environments in which the addition of regular teachers had literally zero impact on student learning. And we have seen around the world again and again and again the promise of community schools, when given sufficient control over their own schools, to produce equivalent learning, or better, often at a fraction of the cost of the regular schools. The problem, and this is a problem that has been pointed out, uh, I mean, Louis Crouch, is Louis here? Louis? Anyway, Louis Crouch um, uh, and his co author from 1997 have this quote that I'll let you read. And all of us who've worked in education recognize this that if it does, doesn't matter what country you go to, if you want to see a good school, they can actually show you a good school. There are good schools everywhere. You can go into the heart of the most chaotic city and there are you know, interesting educational things being done where students are engaged, teachers are engaged, learning is going on. And then you can <laughs> swing a string, so to speak, and walk 200 yards away and find a school where nothing is going on. Teachers aren't there, students aren't learning. So the real problem is not just that people don't know what to do, but people don't know how to get the system such that the pressures of the system produce good outcomes diffused into practices that are being widely adopted. Now, here's where we get back to the, a metaphor that I use throughout the book that I've adopted from some, uh, an earlier work by uh, business consultants describing organizations, and I've readopted it to think about systems, which is between a spider and a starfish. A spider is a system that has a large web, 
a large amount of resources that it's deployed to keeping the spider alive, and but all of the information that's generated and all of the value of the web depends on being it being transmitted to the brain at the center of the spider, and then the spider responds. So completely centralized control versus a starfish. A starfish is a really interesting kind of creature because it has no brain. It actually doesn't move because some of the tentacles sense something and send signals to a central nervous system that aggregates the information and says, let's go over there. It moves when its local feelers say, hey, it looks like there's some food this way. I want to move this way to get more of the food. And there's more signals from this side than that side. So the starfish doesn't move because the starfish decides to move. The starfish moves because the starfish moves. Because the individual responses of the starfish to the local environment it is add up to movement. So the two characteristics that are super important for the way in which a system is going to work is whether the system is closed to novelty or open to novelty. And second, how that novelty is evaluated. Is that novelty evaluated by delivering on functionality, or is that novelty evaluated by conformity with an existing agenda? When you get spiders, systems that lock in on a relatively closed system that make it difficult for new entrants to come in, and the evaluation of novelty is on agenda conformity, you create an environment in which the agents in the system, the organizations, the leaders, and the frontline workers, are induced into strategies of isomorphic mimicry as their optimal survival strategies. The best thing to do as the principal of a school is to produce a school that's an isomorphic mimic if you're trapped in a spider system. Because doing anything other than that not only will not get you accolades, <laughs> it will get you nothing but grief. So the point of this is that we can't just have success here and say, oh, but there's this really successful guy off in some corner of Pakistan that's doing great things with schools. That's the way of the future. Well, the role in a spider system of that kind of innovation is to get crushed, is to just die out because it's resisting the pressure of the system. The only way to make demonstrated success be the desired strategy of leaders and frontline workers is to change the system such that the system endogenously pursues and rewards those characteristics by being open and by having an evaluation of what's new according to a agreed upon criteria of functionality. So <clears throat> this leads me to try and lay out what I think are the six principles of an effective starfish system. And there are these six. First, it's open. Second, it's locally operated. Not locally controlled, but locally operated. Very different distinction. It's performance pressured. It's professionally networked among the frontline workers and leaders. It's technically supported, and it's flexibly financed. So what does open mean? Entry and exit is relatively easier to create, so we can generate some ecological learning. Right? Locally operated means when we have thick decisions that need to be made, those are made based by people at, who are up, make, can make those decisions at the local level. Performance pressured <laughs> means that there's a metric. We know what's going to work. So the reason economists, by the way, you might say, why do economists love the market? And I use that word love. It's not like, why do economists analyze the market and come away thinking it might be Pareto optimal? That's not what real economists think. Real economists love the market, right? Why do they love the market? They love the market because when the market is properly constructed as a performance pressured starfish system, you can build a better mousetrap and people will beat a path to your door. What does that mean? It means there's a functional evaluation of a mousetrap. Does it catch mice? And when people find a mousetrap that catches mice, they can buy the new mousetrap. That simple structure allows lots of performance to happen. right? So it's unleashing that kind of performance in a dead spider system. The problem is it's almost the exact opposite of an effective starfish system. right? There's no real scope for entry. 
key decisions are made centrally. The pressure is on a limited number of very thin bureaucratic criteria, not really on an agreed upon performance metrics. You end up with vertically organized uh, frontline workers, not professionally networked. Um, you end up with a hierarchy that instead of being technical support to the front line is seen mostly as a hostile imposition. And you end up with budget tied to inputs, not tied in a flexible way to allow local people to make local decisions. So the last thing I want to say is I have tried to avoid advocacy of a particular kind of effective starfish. Once you're trapped in the model of a dead spider, the fantasy that you're going to revive the spider is a powerful fantasy but must be resisted. Um, <laughs> once a spider is dead, it will stay dead. But there are lots of different ways one can move towards starfish systems. So I am an, oftentimes it gets that people are advocates of a particular configuration of a starfish system. I'm much more agnostic. I think it's like a toaster, lots of ways to build a toaster. Now in a toaster, all the wires have to hook up in the right way for the current to go through and make toast. But you can have lots of different designs of a toaster. These, I feel, are the principles of defining a system. Then there are lots of different ways in which these principles can be implemented in a local context. Right? So I'm going to conclude, in semi-conclude in a way that unfortunately is necessary, <laughs> which is I have to say what I'm not saying. right? Because because I'm an economist, because I'm an economist economist, people will hear me saying privatization, even though you've noticed I've never, ever, ever used the word, right? I'm not saying privatization. I am saying privatization is one way that, if properly designed, will get you to an effective starfish system. But privatization can be done in other ways that won't lead to particularly good results, too. So a privatization is a subset of an effective starfish system. I am not saying bottom-up is a panacea. If you empower local schools without a performance metrics, without flexible financing, without technical support, you will not get a dynamic of good results. So I am not saying bottom-up. I'm saying bottom-up embedded in a system in which they're pressured and supported. I am also not saying, and this is for an American audience, <laughs> I am not saying high-stakes testing. Um, High stakes testing of teachers, neither teachers nor students is a panacea. It's performance pressured, I mean the system's performance pressured, with maximal information. Now, if you look at how that information is used, using thin performance information may be as damaging as a top down technique of the spider as using thin input information. It might be better, might be worse, but it's not what I'm talking about when I talk about a spider system in which local decisions can be made locally provided with information and transparency. A very different thing. So this is what I mean by the rebirth of modern schooling, is that it's time that we go, we started with learning goals. No one ever started with the goal or desire that a kid in India would spend six years in school and not emerge able to read. Nobody ever wanted that. So what we have to get is get back from schooling goals to learning goals, and that's going to be um, mapping to escape from the dead spider systems that were created, as Nancy pointed out, as part of an earlier 20th century. We're still locked in the schools of the early 20th century. We're locked in the schools and schooling systems that were designed um, when all other parts of our society and, and economy have changed into effective starfish systems by which I mean this acronym, which will never catch on. Um, and I'm holding a lottery for the one that, have, 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 that invents the best name. But I think an effective starfish system that provides openness to innovation, that provides <clears throat> low control of local operation so that teachers committed to teaching can do their jobs and parents can have local accountability, that's performance pressured so everyone in the system has information about how the system is performing and how their school is performing and how their child is performing. That's professionally networked so that the frontline workers can talk and learn from each other and good practices can diffuse in a horizontal way among professionals. That's technically supported so that teachers and other frontline workers both before and after get the support they need 
um, pedagogically and otherwise to carry out their jobs, and it's flexibly financed so that money can flow to where it does the most good in educating children. Thank you very much. So we're going to try and get Beth, whom I'm about to introduce, and Lant to come up and sit Lant in the middle and Beth over there, right. So now I'm very pleased to introduce Beth King, uh, who is the Director of Education in the Human Development Network of the World Bank. I guess that's about to become a global practice or something like that. <laughs> um, that makes her the senior spokesperson uh, for the World Bank on global policy and strategic education issues. But Beth is not here to explain about the World Bank. She is he here at, because she is one of the world's experts on education in developing countries and how to deliver it and how to think about it. It's very nice for me to have Beth here she might not, I think she must remember that we were together in a PhD program uh, some decades ago. And since then, among the many things that Beth has done, I'm particularly, you know, I particularly remember the report on gender, which was maybe 2000. 2000. It's an outstanding report. It, ha it stands the test of time. I recommend it to any of you who's interested and concerned. You should all be with that issue. Um, Beth has published numerous papers on schooling, and I'm sure she's going to explain to us that she was ahead of the curve. I know she was, in uh, way ahead of World Bank education stats, which no doubt is done somewhere else in the big old World Bank, right? Uh, in instigating the program that Lant referred to called Learning for All. So Beth is going to make some remarks and comments on the book, and then we'll have a little conversation up here, and then we'll turn it all over to you. I know there are many people in the room, many people in the room, who have been thinking about this issue for many years. Beth. Thank you very you much, You can Nancy. do it there or come up here, whichever you prefer. Uh, maybe I'll go there, because... So first, I, I wanted to say, I want to say that land. There was one more characteristic of a starfish that you did not mention, which I think is useful, and you might be able to use it for the next paper. Uh, which is that starfish actually can grow an arm if they're hurt, right? So that might be a useful little bit of information for the next one. I am not going to show a PowerPoint because I don't think it's going to be. I don't think I can do better than the, than the pictures that you've seen from Lant, uh, certainly not this, the snake one. So I just want to give some thoughts about this, this book, which I read. Um, uh, the, I read the manuscript some time ago and gave a few comments. And the book is stunning. Uh, I have heard Lant give talks about various parts of the book, but reading the book as one and seeing his argumentation, the, the, the use of, of data, and uh, his conclusions, the book is really stunning. And I hope that you will pick it up and read it. The core message of Lance's book is really at the heart of today's educational challenge, which is education is more than schooling, and schooling is not learning. If there's anything that you should take away from today, I think that should be it. While many developing countries have achieved remarkable progress in schooling, they are not achieving the education goal of learning. And this is a message that's taking hold, but taking hold slowly. I will, he's already given you examples of some of the, where the, the conversation is changing in the high level uh, the report of the high-level panel for the post-2015 development agenda. It's 
clear that that panel is thinking about learning and not only about enrollment. This, the conclusion of the global consultations related to the work of the high-level panel also was really beginning to, to look at learning for all. The work of the Learning Metrics Task Force, which Lant had mentioned. And last week in, in New York, I was sitting uh, at, uh, at the breakfast of the Global Business Coalition, and there was a slide called learning for all, and I nearly fell off my seat. So it, it seems to me that really I agree with Lant. This, this shift from schooling to learning is really taking hold. Lant began writing his book well before these consultations and global events. In fact, if some of you recall, he began asking the question, where have all the education gone? Which is really, I think, when he started to talk about the, the fact that education was not leading to learning and was not really leading to growth. Actually, there it was growth lent. On the overall message, at least, of these consultations and these global events, emphasizing learning as the goal for education, he would feel at home in these discussions. But many discussions of learning turn very quickly into a discussion about quality education. And this is really where Lant parts company with others, and so do I. And that's really what he was showing as the quality education being really mostly about a facade. I very much like Lance's point about the false dichotomy between, and also false substitution between quantity and quality. He didn't emphasize that too much this afternoon, but that's a big part of uh, also of the book, that we cannot, for those people who really want to see universal enrollment rates in basic education. When we sequence our conversation, first quantity, then quality. It is, it's a myth. I don't think we are going to achieve universal education. Um, we won't achieve the education for all goals without improving learning. Um, that is, I think, and a, a, a real myth, and unfortunately, the discussions um, last week were very much um, were very much pre uh, working on the premise that in fact we just need to focus on getting those 57 million children out of school into school, as though that was a separate goal and different from and separate from learning. Distinguishing between quality education and learning, or broadly schooling versus learning, is very hard to make, I found, to the education community in particular. There simply is a common held belief that putting more and better inputs will get us to more learning. For example, the phrase quality schooling is one that appears repeatedly in education plans and many education documents of of international organizations. More trained teachers, more textbooks, more supplies. These mores could improve learning, as Lance showed us, but do they do that to an expected or intended degree? And Lant again showed us that the answer to that question is no. So I've heard Lant give presentation on parts of the book, and I've told him that I can't get tired of his yarn about isomorphic mimicry, about camouflage and education systems, because as he puts it, people get bored silly. I think I'm quoting you verba verbatim here. Bored silly when we talk about systems. But his analogies in his book capture the essence of the arguments. The demand for, for, uh, to build model schools in some countries is, is indeed about isomorphic mimicry, and it is difficult very difficult to persuade policymakers that they are not that these are not a path to to producing better learning. One of the messages of the World Bank's education strategy is that improving an education system in such a way as to make more and better inputs effective is what we need to do. So if you don't mind, I want to say something about that strategy. Not about the organization. 
simplifying the curriculum, which is in Lance's book, monitoring how children are doing against that curriculum, and supporting teachers and students to address obstacles. These are what Lance has been focusing on, are aspects of what it means to improve the way education systems operate. Now, because talking about systems approach, once I start talking about that, I, I notice eyes glaze over and eyes beginning to turn down to read email. So I, too, have been using analogies to bring home the message about a systems approach to education reform and investments. But I haven't been using the colorful analogies that, that Lant has been using. Instead, I've used the image of a plumbing system to illustrate the point that information about what students are learning not being measured and not being communicated to parents, school principals, and education officials is like having a blockage in your plumbing system at home. Not only unpleasant, but also ineffective. In the manner of Lance biological analogies, I have also compared the education system to the human body with the body organs representing parts of an education system. For example, the heart to represent teacher policies, the gut to represent finance and school management, for example, the lungs to, to represent a student uh, assessment mechanism. We can go, we can do things to improve the policies related to teachers, so related to the heart, or to standards or to school management. But if policies in one organ, in one area, do not link or if they contradict policies in another policy domain, such as when standards do not find their way into how teachers are trained, how teachers are supported, and how teachers are paid, then we have an arterial blockage on our hands. So a system approach is more than shouting for just more books, more desks, more teachers. Providing these inputs is, however, the easy part of the job. The idea of disruptive innovations is an important one. We need to address the blockages in the education system in order for inputs to make a real difference to learning. Finally, I know that you're wanting to get to the conversation here. One very strong message from Lance's book is that we have to improve the quantity and quality of education data, as well as the use of those data to document learning the learning crisis in countries and to address that crisis. Uh, the World Bank's ed stats actually depends on UNESCO and what we, just a, just a footnote. Student assessments are typically applied at a specific grade or age, for example. So I just wanted to point out one thing that Lant does do in his book. But note that Lant was able to use uh, the up APRA tests in India that test students in multiple grades and track them over time and so was able to show that the grade learning profiles of students is flat. Now this data is definitely not in the UNESCO database and it's not in the bank database. A frequently mentioned figure in New York last week was 57 million children who are not learning in school. I have actually asked how UNESCO has come up with this number, given that, in fact, the countries with the most number of uh, children not in school do not have data, um, uh, in, at least in more than one year. So like Lant, I have also been making the point that uh, many of these children whom we say uh, are out of school are not necessarily children who have never entered school. Many of them are children who have actually dropped out given given up on school. And if you if we had better data, we would be able to distinguish between those children who have never entered school and those children who have given up on school. And by knowing the distinction between those uh, among those children, we would be better able to uh, understand how to expand, how to get them back into school. So one plea to all, not only better enrollment, uh, data or better learning data, but also better cost and spending data on education. Education data in developing countries are not reliable or comparable. And yet, if we need to really know what we have to do 
uh, and how, what, what dollars we need for what we need to do, we need to have those data. So, there are many things to like about Lance's book. He writes in his unique voice, as you note, noted today, full of data and analogies. Uh, most books about education reforms will not mention snakes, spiders, starfish, or elephants. There are elephants in the book, too. To present a concept and to make a point. For these reasons, Lance's book can play, will play, the tremendously important role of ma making people rethink what they know or think they know about education, schooling, and learning. Thank you.